Good evening, and welcome to the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts in the beautiful Berkshire Mountains of Western Massachusetts. This annual lecture series is sponsored by the Environmental Studies Department and generous donors to MCLA. We thank our donors for their past and ongoing support, and we thank you for being here tonight. Tonight marks our sixth lecture in the spring 2024 series called Greening New England. Each week's lecture will highlight the organizations, achievements, and ongoing efforts that are making New England more sustainable. So far over the first five weeks, we've heard about land conservation work by the Berkshire Natural Resources Council, holistic land use planning from the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission, stream restoration and habitat improvement by Trout Unlimited and other topics. You can find previous recordings on our YouTube channel called MCLA ENVI. Tonight we will learn about the perspective of land management and conservation from a federal perspective, specifically the United States Forest Service. The US Forest Service manages nearly 200 million acres of land, including two national forests right here in New England. Tonight's presentation will be given by Martina Barnes. Martina is a district ranger on the Manchester Ranger District of the Green Mountain and Finger Lakes National Forest. She recently completed a detail as interim chief of staff to the regional forester for the Forest Service's Eastern Region. She previously served in the Forest Service's headquarters office as a legislative affairs specialist, working closely with members of Congress on the agency's most pressing issues. And prior to that, she worked in the Forest Service's Intermountain Region as the Utah Liaison. And she's also held various roles in the state, private, and tribal forestry mission area of the US Forest Service. She has a bachelor's and master's degrees from un in urban and regional planning from Cornell University. She and her husband and two teenage children live in Manchester Center, Vermont. And please help me welcome Martina to MCLA tonight. Hi, everyone. How's everybody doing? So far, so good. Can I, is the, the audio is good volume? OK, great, great. So um, thanks to the students for being here and the guests for being here. It's um, a, my pleasure to speak with you tonight um, a little bit about the Forest Service and some of the work we have going on in Vermont, uh, just, well, 15 minutes or so away from here, as you probably know, very close to um, Pownall, Vermont is uh, part of has land within the Green Mountain uh, National Forest. Um, so tonight, I just wanted to, um, well, I already had the thank you, for Dan, for the nice um, introduction. Wanted to just tell you a little bit about why I became a district ranger and kind of the, my career path, since many of you are probably thinking like, OK, if this is a type of job or if you are interested in a federal land management agency, like what? Um, maybe what leads you to that path. Um, and then I want to talk about what the Forest Service is and the, specifically what the Green Mountain National Forest is within the Forest Service. Um, a little bit of background about the laws that um, help guide the management that the Forest Service does. And then specifically talking about some of the projects we have going on right here, sort of in your backyard, so to speak, within an hour or less of where you are here right now. And so, I really, and I want to make this, and I'm, I'm going to speak, but then at the end have plenty, hopefully, plenty of time for a little interaction because um, the work that I do is really, it's, a lot of it is a give and take um, with the public because we, or I am responsible for stewarding your lands. I mean, as U.S., you know, as residents and U.S. citizens, we have the honor and, and privilege of having beautiful public lands to um, steward for you know current and future generations. So um, I'm just you know one blip on the screen, and then someone else will come in after me and take that role on. So yeah, be thinking about that as you think about um, the national forest and and what the activities that go on there, and whether you support them or don't support them. And that's a lot of what I have to decide: is is this the right decision for the right time for now? So. Um, so this, a little bit about me, I mean, my kind of love for the outdoors was inspired a little bit by my parents. I did a lot of camping on Cape Cod. Um, I also did a summer as an 
uh, intern for the Student Conservation Association, which I, if you haven't heard of, I would like really, really strongly encourage you to check it out. Uh, they, um, the founder of the Student Conservation Association actually lives in Vermont, um, and she, you know she's uh, her name is at the tip of my tongue and it's escaping me at the moment, but she's a lovely woman who, who founded the Student Conservation Association back in the 19, I think, 60s. Um, so they can offer you opportunities to work on that in national parks and fish and wildlife refuges and the national forests. So um, that really helped inspire me to work in um, the area that I work in. Uh, I also worked in New York City um, after studying urban and regional planning. Uh, as Dan mentioned, I studied that as my undergraduate degree, which kind of gave me the foundation for being interested in understanding how communities uh, function and the importance of having different land uses planned correctly within a community, um, not just, you know, putting a residential area next to a, an industrial chemical plant and putting parks near where people live and you know just thinking about where land uses make sense in a community that really interests me and it's a little bit of what I do now like why why do we I'll be talking about a, a mountain bike trail that's going through Vermont like helping to think about okay how does that what uh, what should the path of that mountain bike trail be? Should we be putting it near communities so people can grab lunch or um, meet a friend if they want to, you know, go on a hike, uh, go on a bike ride together? So thinking about land use planning um, is a passion of mine. Um, and then I I really just like I said earlier have a a strong desire to leave you know, leave the world a, a better place than as I, as I inherited it as a district ranger and, and to pass my legacy on to some, someone else once I'm done doing this job. So that is why I do what I do. And I would encourage all of you, no matter what you're interested in, try to think about a, in your career path a job that you're doing something that excites you, that interests you, um, not just... It's nice to have a high paying job, but at the end of the day, we spend eight to 10 hours a day or more at our jobs. And if you're doing something that interests you, the time goes much quicker and, and, and you'll be happier in the end too. Um, so as far as the Forest Service, just the mission statement, a lot of people think of me as a park ranger, but I, I'm not a park ranger. Um, and it's, it, I just wanted to explain the difference. So the Forest Service, is has a mission statement of um, sustaining the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests. So, timber harvesting and um, doing other activities like offering uh, permits for grazing activities. In some cases, out west, we also um, issue permits for uh, oil and gas drilling on national forests. Is it's those types of activities are not generally, I don't work for the National Park Service, but in general, the National Park Service has a much different mission statement and their mission statement is focused on preservation, not active management of the lands that um, encompass the uh, Park Service versus the Forest Service. So just wanted to raise that for awareness and distinction since it, sometimes people get it confused. Um, this map just, um, it's hard to see, and I can email Dan the PowerPoint after this um, presentation, but the top left uh, slide, just so you can see it, um, shows the expanse of the National Forest in Vermont. It's about 420,000 acres uh, that covers two ranger districts. <clears throat> Excuse me, we also have a small portion of the National Forest in the Finger Lakes of New York, um, outside of Hector, New York, on the Seneca Lake. Um, so even though you're probably wondering, like, what does that have to do with Vermont? It's just, it's um, administratively, uh, we, the Finger Lakes National Forest is part of our forest. So 
even though they're geographically separate, they're administratively part of the same organization because it's too small. The Finger Lakes forest is too small to be a separate forest. And then um, there are two districts, what we call districts in Vermont, the Middlebury Rochester district, which is the northern half of the forest, and then the district that I manage is called the Manchester Ranger district. And that is on the, the slide to the right uh, shows the expanse, and that is about <clears throat> 240,000 acres. And it spans approximately from, like if you know Vermont a little bit, um, kind of where Route 4 is, where if you've ever been to Killington, sort of around that area, just south of there, all the way to the Massachusetts border, so down to where we are today. So there are some national forest lands in Pownall and Stamford, um, Woodford, Reedsboro, sort of the southern, maybe some of the towns you might be familiar with if you live or if you're going to school here. Um, there are five designated wilderness areas in the uh, Man on the Manchester Ranger District as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, for a small forest, I mean, compared to Western forests, we're very small. Mo many Western forests have like two, three, four million acres, and we only have you know 420,000. It's it's kind of you know a drop in the bucket, but what I kind of, I challenge people who say, oh, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal managing the forests in the east because we deal with so many, um, so much visitation and also um, from a political standpoint, working it, just on the Manchester Ranger District, there are about 29 individual towns and each town has, a, well, most towns have a town manager and a, a select board. And so there's a lot of local politics involved in managing the forest in the east, um, which you don't have as much in the west. There's just large areas of kind of almost uninhabited lands. Um, so um, so he, you can read um, the text on the slide, but um, a big part of the work we do, re we rely on partnerships with um, organizations that you probably have heard of. I guess you heard you met with Trout Unlimited. Um, some of the local land trust organizations. We work closely with the Trust for Public Land, the Conservation Fund, the Nature Conservancy, um, other organizations like that. So we don't just operate in a vacuum. We, we work closely with our partners. Um, the laws that govern, these are just a snapshot of the laws that we have to follow uh, to manage the National Forest. Um, you probably have heard of NEPA. So literally anything we do or that anything that I oversee in the Forest Service has to comply with NEPA, which basically means we need to go through um, an environmental analysis as well as we have to do scoping, which means we ask the public for feedback on projects. And depending on the size and scale of the project, that dictates the type of um, public involvement. But um, I can't just say, oh, okay, we're gonna cut that tree or you know, we're gonna you know, build this trail there. It doesn't work that way. It goes through a very rigorous um, and sometimes lengthy uh, environmental review. Um, the, so that's NEPA and that was passed in 1970. Um, and then NIFMA, the National Forest Management Act, is of 1976, that, that act required each forest to develop a plan. So kind of like when you, if you are familiar with like town planning or local planning, you have a, uh, not all communities have these, but some do have a, some sort of a land use plan that guides the activities in the, that are allowed, or you might have heard of like a zoning plan. So the forest plan identifies different management areas for each um, section of the forest and certain activities are permitted or certain activities are not permitted depending on the management area of the forest. So it's, it's sort of like a master plan. So it does not, the plan does not go into like great detail about specific projects. That's what the, 
we do through our specific like program of work, but the plan is a guidance document. It's just sort of a, an overall general guidance document. Each forest is supposed to update their plans within the, the suggested time frame is like 20, maybe 30 years. Well, really 20 years, I believe, but because it takes so long to update and go through the public process of updating the plan, the, our, pl our, our plan is actually considered still pretty um, current, and it was updated, I believe, in 2006. Um, so it's still like okay now, but within the next 10 years or so, don't quote me on that, we may be beginning, be beginning the forest plan update process. Um, so it, it does take uh, a while, several, usually like two years or so to do the whole update of a forest plan. Um, I just threw, threw it, sprinkled a few Aldo Leopold quotes in there, but um, since you're students, I think, you know, the key thing from my perspective, which is why I, I like working at the ground level, is like you have to get out in the field. Like you're never going to understand anything about what land management is until you go in the field and like walk the land, touch the soil, you know, sit under a tree and, and, and just kind of listen and, and absorb the nature around you. So um, I love Aldo Leopold. So um, I wanted to just talk in general about some of the uh, issues that we grapple with. Um, in, and these are, in these issues are almost, I would say, probably consistent throughout the whole Forest Service. Um, and one of the big ones that you probably also have seen, since, especially since COVID, is just the increased demand for recreation and the uh, specific pressure of increased hiking. Then you have bikers. Currently, we even have electronic bikes, which are technically um, in the Forest Service treated differently from your traditional bikes. but. Um, the challenges of managing those because they are uh, technically motorized vehicles, even though they're, the motor is small. Um, and then, you know, we have horses, and then we have ATVs, motorized ATV use in the summer, and then snowmobiles in the winter. So um, the challenges is that a lot of the trails that we manage should really be designed for multiple uses, but Let's be honest, if you've got an ATV on a trail, you're probably not going to ride your want to also ride your horse on that trail because, you know, it's just not compatible necessarily. So the challenge is do you, and I, it's why I kind of asked some prompting questions just for you to think about, like how do we, and I'm using we as like a general collective public we, manage this increased demand to get outside. It's great that more people want to get outside and recreate and use the public land, but how do we manage the resource pr properly and protect it while also dealing with the fact that more people are out there riding their ATVs or riding their bikes or hiking or um, so, and then the the big question is, you know, can you love a place to death? And that's especially, I think, not as relevant here on the Green Mountain National Forest, but if any of you have ever been to Zion National Park or Yosemite National Park, um, Grand Canyon, you know, any of these, uh, specifically the national parks, and even the White Mountain National Forest in New Hampshire gets very, very high visitation um, in the summer months. The, you, these um, land management agencies have had to come up with very creative solutions to deal with the visitation challenges, like creating shuttle bus service, um, like to allow people to park off the, you know, offsite and shuttle people in groups so that there's less tra like car traffic on the roads. Um, you know, ju that's just one example, but. 
it's, it, it is kind of a challenge that, you know, fortunately we have not dealt with or I have not dealt with in Vermont yet, but it's going to become a, a greater challenge um, as more people want to recreate. Um, some other, you know, more natural challenges, if you will, not necessarily, you know, or definitely not directly human um, challenges are invasive plant species. Maybe you've learned a little bit about this in your class and some of the um, common invasive plants that we deal with, um, hunt Japanese honeysuckle, knotweed, um, multiflora rose, a lot of very, very um, aggressive and, um, you know, very aggressively, and when I say aggressive, I mean they grow in all types of conditions, particularly um, if in challenging conditions that perhaps native species may have a harder time growing in. And um, so I just wanted, these are some of the challenges that we deal with when managing the actual forest resource um, is how do we treat those plants you know, without we have to be very careful to protect water quality, so we try at all, at if at all possible, to use um, mechanical means to pull or treat um, and not use um, pesticide. I mean, sometimes you do have to like very targeted in a very targeted way use pesticides. But for example, in wilderness areas, we cannot use any <clears throat> pesticides, so we have to use mechanical means to get rid of some of these plants. And if you've ever seen them, I mean, it's like they can take over literally a whole like river corridor or area and it's very hard to get rid of it once um, it's allowed to grow. So what we actually do is we check all trucks, like when we work with partners, we make sure that their vehicles are clean before we allow them on the forest for a project. So there's um, certain what we call mitigations that we require for our um, contractors or our partners before they do projects because it, it's like horrible once you introduce an invasive plant in an area where it's not present and it's really, really hard to get rid of it once it's there. Um, also just wanted to touch on the bat. Uh, um, the northern long-eared bat was um, uplisted, what, which basically means it was, it now has the highest level of protection in, I believe, March of 2023. It's now considered federally endangered. And so <clears throat> we have to be very careful when the little babies are roosting um, in trees. We, so we have very specific uh, time periods where we cannot cut trees down. Um, specifically, I think it's like May, maybe mid-May to mid-July. Again, don't quote me exactly. I am not a, a wildlife biologist, but there are very specific um, process, uh, rules that we need to, or laws now that we need to follow um, when we implement projects to protect the, the bats. Because um, there's, uh, yeah, you may have, you know, have bats in your, there's, there's about nine different species of bats, I guess, in Vermont, but uh, the northern long-eared is um, federally endangered. Um, fire, I just wanted to touch on the importance of fire, you know, um, in our forest ecosystem. Uh, you probably have seen um, the impacts of wildfire in recently, last summer in Canada, and, uh, and the, you know, catastrophic wildfires out west. But here in Vermont, for the time being, we don't have to worry about those types of fires. Um, in fact, we see fire as our, like our friend and uh, as a great management tool to help treat invasive plants, to actually um, burn uh, the underbrush of the forest, to promote growth. It really it helps certain tree species actually benefit tremendously from fire. Um, the Native Americans used fire as a management tool for you know, millennia before European settlers came to um, Vermont. So uh, we are trying to introduce fire in small pockets throughout the Manchester Ranger District. And um, so I just wanted to mention that. Um, 
also, and I'll be touching again on this, but we one um, specific project that we're doing is, is called the Early Successional Habitat Project. And um, what that means is that the, the goal of the project is to create a younger uh, forest age class in, um, on the Manchester Ranger District. Um, it involves timber harvesting, which um, in, my in a few slides I'll talk a little bit about some of the, um, the ch one of the challenges that I face is, um, as a district ranger is listening to all of the different publics. Um, there are some people who are very opposed to cutting it down any trees and are specifically concerned about um, old growth forests and obviously climate change is, is something that we are very much we care about and we are also very much listening to the public and not wanting to impact any um, old growth forests um, here in Vermont. So um, the, this project involves uh, cutting about 15,000 acres over about 15 years. So it's, um, the, the goal is 1,000 acres per year, but we have not yet even, we haven't even cut close to that so far since I've been um, the district ranger. It's been just a few hundred acres a year probably that we actually cut. Um, and then, you know, what, I just posed this question, sort of what resource is the most important one to protect? I, there's, there's no right answer to that question, but it, it's something, a good thing to kind of think about in your own mind, you know. You have recreation, you have waterways, you have trees, you have wildlife, you know, which, 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 which of those resources gets, you know, should be um, the most important one to protect. I, and I don't think that there is no right answer, but it's, um, it's something to kind of think about um, as you, you know, in your own life to, um, you know, competing priorities which is the title of my presentation. Um, I wanted to touch on just specifically a few, um, a few projects on the district that um, I just did a little bit as with the Early Successional Habitat Project, but you may have heard of the Vellamont um, Mountain Bike Trail Project. If you Google it, you'll get more specific information, um, but it is a partnership with the, what's who, an organization called the Vermont Huts Association and the Vermont Trail Co Collaborative, that's the VHA and the VTC. And the goal is to create a mountain bike system through Vermont um, from Canada to Massachusetts. It's actually not going to be running through this part of Massachusetts, it's further east, so it's gonna go through <clears throat> Whittingham, um, Vermont, and then sort of more southeast towards Massachusetts, so due east of here. Um, and so we, we've been working to help identify uh, certain segments that are existing trails. So the, the hope is to, to really not build a lot of new trail, but to use existing trail systems. And in some cases, the trail will also be on roadways for short periods. But the goal of the um, effort is to really help link communities uh, to mountain biking and really to give, make, mount, make biking more accessible to uh, greater segments of the population. So there will be some sections of trail that are not single track, but are more like accessible to someone with a stroll, <clears throat> pulling a stroller or um, someone who has some physical disabilities and may not be able to ride a mountain bike. Um, in a single track, like on a single track trail. And as I mentioned earlier, like all new trail construction is, does require our, our NEPA analysis. And um, we sometimes unfortunately find uh, parts of unauthorized trail, new trails across the forest. And we try to figure out like who built them because, you know, it's, it's, well, first of all, it is illegal, and um, 
Second of all, sometimes that ha what happens is people, they are only thinking of their own you know, self-interest, like, oh, I want to ride my bike, so I'm going to create a trail in this little part of you know, the forest. But they don't realize there may be a sensitive plant species that lives there or some sensitive animal that lives there or there may be some archaeological, I mean, we, we have to be very careful about heritage resources and protecting historic resources. And so people, I, I'm mentioning it just because you, you all, um, or many of you are very young or a lot younger than me, and just to be thinking about that, like, it, when you, you might think, oh, it's not a big deal, I'm just making a trail, I'm not like really hurting anyone, but you, you may have, there may be some unintended consequences um, to your actions. And so when we do find that, we, we try to figure out who did it. And um, it's, it's difficult though, because I don't, what often happens then is it, it's hard to restore a trail that was, that's been illegally built back to its natural condition. So um, we, we do our best to create barriers on the trails and, and try to put brush it in, what we call brush it in, which means filling in the gaps that, of the trail that was illegally created. But um, it's hard to do after it's created. So that's why it's better to do it the right way the first time. Um, so I, I put some, I'm in my notes, I, I put discuss like a land management opportunity and a land management challenge. So may, maybe if we have time at the end of the talk, I can talk about some of those, but because um, I, I have a few ideas or I can pass them on if, if you're interested. Um, <clears throat> this next slide is about the early successional habitat project that I talked about. So the, the goal of that project is to create this young forest that is really benefiting neotropical migratory birds. So um, when, when birds migrate you know, to South America or South for the winter, uh, the, and they come back in the spring and summer up north, uh, the current the national forest as it is right now has, is very mature. Mo most of it was literally clear cut in the 1920s and 30s. Um, just hard to imagine because it's so lush right now, but if you picture looking at the whole Green Mountain National Forest and it was essentially just completely clear cut, which is not at all what we want to <laughs> see ever happen again, but the, the Downside, another downside of that was that is that the forest is was is all like basically one age class. So now we have a very mature forest that is about 80, 90 ish years old, and we don't have the young forest that migratory, for example, a certain wildlife species, um, grouse and um, woodcock, and the, those are more native to Vermont, but also neotropical migrant birds like some young forest habitat. Um, when, when they um, migrate, we have very little of that. So in my slide, it says here, we have less than 1% of that young forest age class. So and our forest plan calls for five to 20%. So we are way, we, we are, we're really lacking in that young forest age class. So um, the um, hope is that through this project, we can create some of that young forest habitat that um, wildlife species uh, desperate, desperately needs. Um, this next slide is um, beautiful, first of all, <laughs> a beautiful view of the grout pond, uh, which is in the town of Stratton. And uh, it's a very popular recreation area. If you've never been there, I would highly recommend checking it out. Um, the, uh, the area is being currently, um, you can, it's, it's currently um, being improved to uh, specifically through um, funding from Congress through the Great American Outdoors Act, uh, which um, is one 
one recent uh, law or that was passed to fund projects, recreation projects specifically throughout the whole country. And so we're going to be making improvements to uh, campsites, like hardening them, uh, building, improving the trail access, uh, creating a boat launch. We There is a boat launch there now, but we're gonna make improvements to it. Um, and also there is, on the slide it says Grout Pond Hut. Uh, there is currently a year-round hut that is operated through a special use permit with the Vermont Huts Association, um, whom I mentioned previously, they're all, they're, that organization is involved with the Vellamont Trail proposal, uh, the mountain bike trail, but th this hut is a year-round hut that you can reserve and stay overnight and it's it doesn't have electricity but it uh, has propane heat and you bring in your own water but uh, it's a it's a really nice spot if you're interested in if you're not interested in tent camping and you want a different kind of overnight experience you can check that out um, so yeah so that's the great grout pond recreation area um, and then, yeah, so finally, like another Aldo Leopold quote of conservation, which is what I consider to be what, what I'm trying to do is establish a state of harmony between man and land. Um, because we, we live here and we uh, enjoy the land and I think appreciate the forest, but, um, we're trying to figure out that balance, strike that balance between uh, enjoying and also taking from the land in a way that the land can re rebuild, rejuvenate, and um, grow, and um, hopefully be not in a worse place than when we left it. So with that, um, that's my final slide, and I can talk about some of my land management challenges and opportunities based on those slides, but I'm looking at the time. I guess I have spoken for 30-ish minutes, so happy to answer any questions. I don't know who to go first. Ah, um, go ahead. Um, could you speak a little bit more about the Great American Ooh, yes and no. Um, I, I, it was, I believe it was passed in 2017, um, and it, the law was specifically designed to fund infrastructure improvements uh, on public lands throughout. So not only the Forest Service, but also national parks and. Um, we, we, the Forest Service, and other agencies like us, because we're like more than 100 years old, a lot of buildings and bridges and trails are just in bad shape. So the goal of the Great American Outdoors Act was to help kind of with some of the deferred maintenance, and by deferred maintenance, it just means like stuff that is not, has not been able to be maintained needs improvements. And so that Great American Outdoors Act is specifically dedicated to not build new stuff per se, but really to fix aging infrastructure. If that helps, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, you had a question, yeah. Does the Catamount Ski Trail go through there? Yeah, through Grout Pond. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I've been there, but why can't the bike trail be the same trail instead of having two separate ones? Yes. Because it, one summer and one winter. Well, yes, I think, the, I think the Vellamont Trail will be co-located with the Catamount in many sections. Oh. Because exactly, it's yeah. it, and that's like a perfect way to accommodate both uses, different seasons. Right. Well, yes. And the Panama's already there. Right. So why, why build another one? Right. Totally. And well, uh, but more people are about the biking with those big fat fire bikes in the winter. But they that's true. Skiers and bikers. And, uh, 
<laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Good. Yeah, Dan. I have a question about energy on the forest. Um, either, is there any sort of extraction or use of this forest for wind or solar or power line corridors? Any, anything like that? Um, that is a good question, um, yes. In fact, the Deerfield Wind Project in, this is bad that I should know the town, I think it is, it's either Searsburg, I think it is Searsburg. Um, you can see it, I think, I think you can see it from North Adams, right? The wind mills, um, for lack of a better word, those are located on the National Forest and that project was, um, and I think still is, the only wind energy project on the National Forests, period. Um, it, but we work with the state fish and wildlife um, agency to track the impacts of those towers to birds and uh, bear and other wildlife to, because there are some concerns over um, the you know damage to the the, the noise the, that it, those they cause and also um, yeah just the impact um, to like because it's a, a physical obstacle to um, migrating wildlife and to birds so um, that is that we don't have any on the Green Mountain National Forest there's no other extractive um, for, which makes my life easier because um, those types of projects can be, you know, f for many reasons, quite controversial in on other national forests. But I don't, we don't have any of those. Just that wind energy project, and I don't know when that's being sunsetted, so to speak. I think it was, it was in the t t mid two thousands, maybe was constructed. I, I don't know that off the top of my head, but Deerfield Wind, you could look it up. Yeah. You were mentioning the uh, long-eared bat. Mm -hmm. Is the little brown bat here in in um, northern Massachusetts and West and Vermont? It yes, it is, and I I actually printed all this stuff out um, to see what. Let me tell you what, unless you know off the top of your head what the protections for that one are, but um, the little. Is state the little brown bat is listed as a state endangered species in Vermont, so it doesn't have any federal protection. But in general, we uh, we work really closely with the state to make sure that um, we actually set up uh, monitoring. It's called acoustic monitoring, where uh, we put monitors in areas where we believe bats might be and that helps us to determine um, you know which areas to avoid for especially for the obvious timber harvesting is so we would avoid areas um, I mean we don't check every single tree but you know we do set up those monitors to um, and we work with the state closely on that so yeah <laughs> Any questions about like careers in the Forest Service or um, besides the other land management challenges, just because you're all young and still have your careers ahead of you? Oh, yes. Do you know off the top of your head of any summer internship opportunities? Well, we, I would highly, re so yes and no. The, the Forest Service does offer internships um, in general, um, but the best in Vermont, since we are a pretty small organization in Vermont, the whole Green Mountain and Finger Lakes National Forest has about 100 employees, which is not that many compared to some of the other forests in the West. Um, we rely heavily on um, partners like so the Green Mountain Club or the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps um, as well as Student Conservation Association so if you're looking for an internship for like a summer or even longer 
those organizations offer internships, it's much easier to get like into those organizations and then you can, if it's, if you also want to write down the public land core is a public law, is a law that allows you, if you work for one of those organizations like Student Conservation Association, Green Mountain Club, um, some of these nonprofit organizations, the time that you work for those counts towards your eligibility for permanent federal jobs. So um, it's, it's called the Public Land Corps Authority. It's a federal hiring authority. And if you, are, you basically have to accumulate hours of service through those nonprofit organizations, that helps you to qualify more easily for federal jobs. So, yeah. I'm wondering why the, you mentioned a goal of a thousand acres mm -hmm. harvested to get to that like zero age class. What, what are the challenges with reaching that goal? It's it, economics a li little bit. Is that we um, in this current economy, a lot of mills you probably have seen in the news. Even a lot of mills have closed. Timber uh, lumber um, mills. And so the, one of the challenges is for um, when we, we don't cut the, t the Forest Service contracts with private companies to cut the timber. We don't actually do it ourselves, but we go, we put a bid out for a contract and sometimes we only get one or two or sometimes no bids for some of our, um, when we advertise a timber sale. So, um, that's one of the challenges is just the um, getting enough interest in um, and then the other challenge is working through we might identify a really large area that we think might be cut but then at the end of the day once we work through all of the environmental um, analysis it usually is a much smaller area that we deem sort of eligible for timber harvesting. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so it's, it's partially the, um, it, but partially a combination of the two, like the, um, that we don't necessarily have as much of area that's, we deem eligible for timber harvest because of restrictions like bats or other sensitive species or sensitive plants or there might be heritage resources that we didn't know about when we did the initial analysis. And then the second reason is the economics that we're not getting as much interest as we um, maybe in the past there was um, so uh, in, in our timber sales. And you know the, the quality, that's the other, the other challenge is as the, as the forest ages, the quality of the timber is not as we have, um, I mentioned insects, I mentioned invasive plants, but there are also lots of invasive insects that like the um, hemlock, woolly adelgid, the emerald ash borer, um, to name a few. There are lots of uh, insects that have basically de beach bark disease um, that ha are destroying um, large swaths of the forest. Even though we don't have wildfires here, we have bugs that do kill, they're killing off the forest as well. And so it's the quality of the timber is another um, limitation for why we're not cutting as much as we could or really need to be to meet our forest plan objectives. So, good questions. Well, I left my, um, well, Dan has my contact information. If folks, I mean, seriously, if even if you want to do like a job shadow um, for a day, you know, like we do fun stuff too, like what's called electrofishing, where we temporarily shock a fish and then we measure that it's, it's, it's all with the goal of trying to determine how good our water quality is in the national forest. So we um, sometimes have, kids come for a day and they um, get to wade in the stream and measure fish and we don't harm the fish, they just 
they're temporarily shocked and it's kind of like you know um, if you get put to sleep for a little bit and then you wake up um, and then we measure them and and take certain statistics and then we work, share that data with Vermont Fish and Wildlife and it's a really useful tool to help determine how healthy our um, streams are so stuff like that is fun or if you want if you're interested in working um, doing some timber related uh, in a job we can can get you out with our timber marking crew where you kind of look at a tree and identify the tree species or if there's any imperfections or you know just in general how to evaluate a tree and what if that is of interest to you we can get you out to do that for a day or if you want to tag along with our recreation folks and just see like what is what's involved with tree uh, trail building or um, trail improvements because we as you know we've had so much rain in Vermont as of late especially and it's really destroyed unfortunately a lot of trails and it's caused a lot of erosion on trails so we we need to um, really think about sustainable trail building and how we can build trails that when it does rain heavily which it will inevitably rain heavily again that the trail isn't just completely washed out. So um, if you're interested in that type of thing too, you can learn a little bit. You are more than welcome to maybe tag along for a day and, and um, see what our trail crews are up to. So I um, think that's it. I've talked about an hour. Oh, yeah. Please take a smoky um, bracelet and or a smoky frisbee <laughs> if not for you for a friend sibling or whoever um, i brought i brought a whole bunch so take one of these thank you <laughs>